Hello everyone, great to CCT you for this latest edition of the Clean Commercial Transportation Update. I'm Bill Van Amberg and we have taken CCTU on the road. We're at the ACT Expo here in Long Beach and we're gonna give you some exclusive looks at what's going on here. As always, to do it, I'm joined by my great partner and colleague, Alicia Gildy. Bill, it is great to be here with you and with our friends with CCTU for our 30-minute broadcast covering the latest and greatest coming out of the Advanced Clean Transportation Expo Hall. You know, we're going to be covering a lot of ground here. There's a lot of product launches. This has been the biggest expo ever. We're going to be looking into some of the new technologies and some context on what that means and some exclusive interviews from the expo floor. I'm really excited about who we're going to be meeting with. Bill, do tell. We'll talk to senior leadership at Navistar. They will share with us what this new Trayton Group acquisition means to their zero emission truck plans. Also, we have the president of Volvo Group North America. They're going to be talking about where they're going with zero emission trucks now that they've just released Gen 2 of the VNR, which is their zero emission Class 8 tractor. Bill, we have so much to do, people to speak to, and technologies to check out. Let's go and do this. Let's hit the floor. Bluebird made an exciting announcement with a partner that moves them from the bus space into the truck space, now making a flexible class four, five, and six truck chassis. Bluebird will once again expand its product range beyond its core school bus market to start serving the dynamic commercial vehicle sector. Today we are combining our first rate manufacturing capabilities with our technological leadership in electric transportation solutions. It is my pleasure to unveil here at ACT Expo Bluebird's groundbreaking Class 5 and 6 electric vehicle chassis. Now, this is an all-electric OEM engineered and built chassis that will define the next generation of e-mobility by enabling a broad range of zero emission commercial vehicles. Now, at this point, I would like to thank our partners, Lightning E-Motors, for working with us on this prototype class six chassis that sits in front of us. So we have a really interesting opportunity to see a bus company becoming a truck company. You don't normally see that, but electrification is making it possible. We're joined by Britton Smith, who's the EVP of electrification at Bluebird, and Tim Reeser, who is the CEO of Lightning E-Motors. Tell us, first of all, what is this partnership enabling you to do? So as a uh, hun almost 100-year-old school bus company, uh, we're very excited to be entering the commercial vehicle space with a groundbreaking strip chassis. Uh, it's first of its kind and uh, covers class five, six uh, 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 vehicles. So I'd say that you know this this chassis is is really groundbreaking in in, in its flexibility and uh, ability to deliver on multiple different missions. Daimler Trucks finally made it official with a big announcement that they're moving into full production with their E-Cascadia electric Class 8 truck. Powered by purpose, fueled by innovation, running on pure electricity. When it comes to conventional tractors on the road today, there is none more successful, none more commonplace, none more ready to answer the call to work than the Freightliner Cascadia. It is the workhorse of the American industry. It is the proven foundation on which our customers bet their livelihoods. And it is the starting point for delivering the country's most proven, most tested, most trusted, all electric Class A truck. This is so much more than just a new product. This is the Freightliner e Cascadia, built on the best-selling heavy-duty truck platform in North America. It epitomizes a paradigm shift in our company's product and business strategy. It presents a tremendous opportunity for our customers to ease into their electric transition. And it is a step forward toward tackling our industry's monumental decarbonization challenge. So, range. What is the range of this truck behind us? We propose multi B battery options and offer and here's a new term that we are using at, at Freightliner DTNA, typical range of 230 miles based on a lot of practical data that we gathered over the 1.5 million miles. This e Cascadia behind me is the first e-truck 
in its family will, will include the Detroit E powertrain. Rakesh, we both know these are only a few, few highlights. 100% electric E Cascadia. to showcase this year, including infrastructure advancements as well as autonomous vehicle solutions. And what we all can say, ladies and gentlemen, is that this development to, to decarbonizing our transport system, this development to, to, to zero emission, it's going on and it's going fast. Today I'm telling you we need to act now. We need to accelerate the shift and we need to deliver. We are going to move towards fossil free transports within the Volvo Group and within Volvo Trucks. Volvo Trucks has set the target for 50% in 2030 and 100% in 2040. With that, then ladies and gentlemen, we will come to a rolling fleet in 2050 that is zero emission. And that is very important. This year in quarter one, we launched the VNR Electric 2. 85% improvement in performance. 270 mile range, not 230, 270 mile range. Six batteries, six by four, six by two uh, 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 configurations. And this is now, you know, accelerating the shift. Let me put it like that, accelerating the shift. Production, ladies and gentlemen, today. It's time to do something, it's time to act now, it's time to deliver now. I am convinced we are delivering and we do that because we have to. We owe it to our children, we owe it to the world, we owe it to the next generations. I think it's important to leave this world in the same or even a better state than where we got it. I thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very good afternoon. has given us a look at new sustainable cooling technologies that are important for transport refrigeration. But the reason we're here to talk today is because we're talking about our zero emissions units where we remove the fuel tank or we remove the engine and in this case a lot of battery electric equipment. Uh, eCool is our name that covers the entire suite of products we have from vans to trailers and whatnot that I'll, I'll walk through one at a time. So when going down the road our electric refrigeration unit is powered by the, the engine generator and when it's standing still, you can plug it into shore power or electric standby. What we've done is we've introduced an electric motor inside the wheel hub. So this little silver disc you see here generates 80 kilowatts of power per wheel. So on, on a full axle, you've got a peak power of 160 kilowatts being generated, being able to feed energy through a battery into the TRU at the, with a vector equal system. So one of the things that we've seen as we've wandered the floor is incredible numbers of zero emission trucks and we're moving into the second generation of these trucks with longer range capabilities and the like but we're still missing some capabilities until some key announcements came out at ACT. That's right. Bill, you know it's really important. So we're electrifying the platform of these vehicles, but we also need to think about as we're delivering goods to grocery stores, how are we keeping the product cool and not running on a diesel truck refrigeration unit, but running on an electric. So we're standing here in front of our friends at Carrier Transicold, and they have the innovative technology to make sure that the complete vehicle, including the truck refrigeration unit is fully electric so reducing our impact on community which is really important and this means ports farms to warehouse to store it's the next tier of capability Penske Truck Leasing and Shell Recharge unveiled a big joint venture where they're going to be building out Penske's truck recharge network We've got some really exciting news that we want to share with you. So Penske Transportation Solutions and Shell are working together to install level two charging to support our growing fleet of light duty vehicles, uh, such as this very nice uh, Ford E-Transit that we have here in our booth today. So not only is Shell providing us the infrastructure support, but also the critical network monitoring and maintenance to ensure that these chargers remain up and we can keep these vehicles running and on the road. We have announced uh, that all the charging uh, solutions for the e-transits, but also every electrification needs that Penske has, Shell will support. 
currently we have sort of something around 30 plus locations that we provide the, the charging solutions with Penske. By the end of the year, we will have something around 100 locations. So that's really an accelerated pathway towards that uh, ambition. And I think the great thing that we see on this announcement today, some of these locations are outside of the West Coast. And that shows also the edge on how are we trying to go further, not only where you have policies in place, but where you actually can lead the way uh, to the energy transition piece. So infrastructure was really one of the showcase topics all over the expo, the expo floor. And it wasn't just people building individual charging sites. We're now starting to talk about charging networks. And Bill, it's really important because we know if we're going to successfully advance the zero emission commercial market, we need to start building out our corridors. And what's really fascinating about this partnership between Penske and Shell Recharge is that they're starting to build out certain locations to support their zero emission fleet. So this can be a model for replication as we want to see more nodes of charging built throughout the network, certainly in California, but beyond. Hey, we're very happy to be joined today by Joanne Golden, who is the Senior Vice President of Programs at Gladstein, Neandros and Associates. They're the ones who put on the big ACT Expo over the years, but this is the biggest First of all, Joanne, thank you for being with us in the midst of this craziness of ACT Expo. Um, as of this moment, we have surpassed 8,000 registrations. And so the, the theme throughout ACT Expo this year is really the desires there, the commitments there, and that we have to do it right now. And what you're seeing across the show floor, across all these different technologies that are here, is a willingness from these vehicle manufacturers, from the charging providers, from the fueling station companies, saying, I'm ready to get there with you. There have been some tremendous moments at ACT, and I got to tell you, there's some takeaways that Alicia and I have been talking about that we, we do want to share. One thing, you look out on this floor and just see the sea of zero emission technologies. Battery electric, fuel cell electric, there's even some hydrogen combustion technologies. And it isn't just the core vehicles that we're seeing, but it's starting to get into Gen 2, Gen 3 systems. That was one of the big takeaways for me to start. Yeah, Bill, it's been so exciting being here and seeing all these vehicles on display. But what was also really promising is the charging technology, yeah. the fueling options that are available. We saw more than 20 vendors out on the floor. The other thing that we saw was more capability for these vehicles, not just the longer distance, not just the better drive line. So we saw some new component structures uh, such as TRUs, battery electric TRUs that would allow all day service. That's a big deal to have more capability and reach more of the vehicles. Those were our big takeaways. Why don't we deep dive now and let's go with some exclusive interviews we did on the show floor with a couple of the big announcements we heard. All right, so we're really so happy to have with us today Peter Bohova, who is the president of Volvo Trucks North America. Volvo's really turned into an aggressive player worldwide on zero emissions technology. So we want to talk to you about today. Uh, you've got the updated VNR, which is really exciting here. You're doing a multiple series of vehicles in Europe. Yeah. Can I just ask, you've got these aggressive targets, 50% of the trucks zero emissions in Europe by 2030, 35% globally. What's, what's your strategy with e-mobility? Why are you so aggressive in it right now? We, well, th Bill, thank you, for all, thank you for being here and thank you for having me. The, the reason we're so aggressive is that we really believe it's time, we need to do something. We've committed to the Paris Agreement, we want to keep the warming of the Earth below 1.5 degrees, uh, and in order to do that, we need to do something. We have committed to the Science-Based Targets Initiative, they calculate our plans. If we want to stick to the Paris Agreement, we have to get started now. We call that ACT now. So we do it with the electric vehicle set up in Europe, we do it with the electric vehicle set up here. Within the group we have set 35% in 2030, Volvo trucks globally, and that includes us, but globally have set 50% in 2030, 100% mm. in 2040, so that ultimately in 2050 we end up with a zero emission fleet, rolling fleet uh, for Volvo trucks. Which is, which is really impressive. So just so people understand that, I don't think Volvo's story gets told well enough on this topic. What is your North American goal? What would you like to hit 
in percentage of sales in North America or the U.S. by 2030 for zero emission. So we, we have our global targets, right? 50 percent, 35 percent. I would like to get as close as possible. At the set, but I mean, what I should say is that we will sell as much as we can. But it has to do. It has it, the, the, the adaptation rate plays a role, and the adaptation rate is driven by the incentive programs that we have today in order to keep the total cost of ownership under control. We need infrastructure development, uh, but we will, I mean, we have prepared our plans for mass production of this electric vehicle. And basically what I can say, we're going to sell and produce as much, much as we can. Well, you know, your team has talked to us a lot about that, uh, that you, you've got the volume set up, you've got capacity yeah. and production yeah. capability. Yeah. So what are those things that really need to be our breakthroughs to make zero emissions go faster and meet the goals you've set for the Volvo yeah. Group? So right now we're really strong with, um, call it urban and regional distribution, uh, drayage for instance, uh, with the VNR electric that you see here behind us. If we really want to get to those goals, we need to go to the longer distances as well. For that we need infrastructure. So even if we're not talking about the long haul vehicles, but the regional vehicles, we need for these vehicles, we need, re we need infrastructure charging as well. There's a lot of home-based or depot-based charging, there's a lot of uh, destiny-based charging, but we need you know, public highway or public charging network as well. That, plus the other thing is the business case needs to be there. We have a very good cooperation with many federal and especially state uh, agencies with incentive programs. We absolutely need those. They need to continue in order to get up to speed and in order to be able to scale up. We've been really working with you and others in the truck industry to get the zero emission incentives at the federal level, which we yeah. desperately need. I had a chance to visit with Martin Lundstedt when I was over at COP26, and he, he, he spoke, he was very good. He talked about this business case and that we're, we're on a curve to be competitive with diesel for all zero emission trucks yeah. by the 2030 mark. Let me ask you, with what's going on in Ukraine, with, with fuel prices actually shooting up, what does that do? Does that actually maybe give us a chance to move faster because the competitive price for the fuel diesel that you're competing against is actually higher, makes electric look uh, better? I'm, I'm not sure if that, of course, you know, the price of fuel plays a role. Uh, at the same time, the whole Russian-Ukrainian crisis that we have also plays a role with the availability of raw materials like, like lithium, for instance. So I think there's a bit of a balanced case there. Uh, at a certain moment, we will reach there. We believe it's before 2030. It's a little. There's many variables. It's a little bit difficult to to uh, to to put a pin on that, so to speak, and to really say this year or that year. One thing I wanted to ask you because I, we've worked with Volvo for years yeah. at CalStar, a great partnership, and you guys have always been constructive with the regulators. I will say that sometimes I I wonder, given your aggressive goals and capability, and given what we're learning about climate and how fast we have to go why Volvo might not be supporting even stronger regs that help you get to your zero emissions goals faster. Can you give me some thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I can give you. So, so regulations are good, obviously, and we all, we, we all strive for the same goal, right? And that is in, in fast, as fast as possible adaptation to zero emission vehicles. Now, but then with regulations, we need to be a little bit careful at the same time because there are rules and then there is um, all kinds of consequences linked to that. I think what is important if we have regulations, that there's a couple of things important. First of all, we should make sure that we involve all stakeholders. Right? So for instance, if you look at the advanced clean truck uh, bill, that's very much focused on the OEM. I will do whatever I can to put as much uh, or as many vehicles on the road as I can, but then they need to be bought as well. And there's, so there's a couple of other variables and a couple of other stakeholders that are not in that equation. So, so, so what we're saying is yes, Regulation is good, but make sure that all, this, all the stakeholders are, are, in, are involved. And then we get there. The other thing that I think is very important as well, let us make sure that we have the opportunity to focus on zero emission vehicles. We will develop our diesel vehicles as well, but let's make sure that, we, that the balance is there, right? So we want to, to, to put the, the majority of R&D on zero emission vehicles. Right, and that's been something we've been talking with all the OEMs yeah. about. I mean, this is we really need to open up a clear pathway that you Absolutely. can start moving yeah. towards zero yeah. emissions. So let me ask you two last questions. I'll let sure. you go. You're a busy man today. One, one is, uh, what, what is your vision for what we're going to see from Volvo over b between now and 2025 and then 2030? Are we going to see a full line of electrified products like you have in Europe, in North America? We will, we will slowly electrify the whole line. 
Uh, as you know, you know, the Volvo Group in North America is not only Volvo Trucks, it's also Mac Trucks. Mac Trucks is electrifying their program as well. So yeah, we will, we will, we will continue to electrify because ultimately, if we want to get to 50 or 35% in 2030, that's not only with the regional haul trucks. So the, the last thing, one of the things I've been so impressed with is the extended range that you've added yeah. in Gen 2 of yeah. the VNR, which I think starts to make it possible to do these next step in longer range trucks. They're not long haul trucks maybe, but they're longer haul trucks. No, do you, I mean, do you see that as a stepping at, stone? Oh no, absolutely. But we decided to come out with the 150 mile range truck for the only reason is that, and that's what we said nine months ago at Act Expo, said we need to act and we need to act now. Yeah. So we have said there's plenty of opportunities and there's plenty of applications that can run electrified with a 150 mile truck. So let's get going. Let's because we, and, and you know that, but I'm going to say it again, we're selling it, we're manufacturing it, we're delivering it and we're servicing it. In the, so whilst we were selling the 150 mile phase one, we were building this beautiful 275 75 mile phase two truck, which is now going into production and we'll continue. Peter, thank you very much. Hey, we're really excited now to have with us Michael Grahe, who is the Executive VP from, of Operations from Navistar. And thanks, first of all, for joining us. And thank Navistar, yeah, Navistar is now part of this big global group, the Trayton Group. Yes. It's become very aggressive. In fact, I would say one of the leaders, if not the leaders, on electrification. What does this do for Navistar in terms of you being able to move faster on electrification? Yeah, first of all, I think Navistar is already quite aggressive. We have already two products in the market. We have our school bus and we have our medium duty EMV in the market. So we are aggressive there. And now we can use the power of the group to roll this out, uh, the electrification to the group portfolio and to the Navistar portfolio. And what does that do in terms of, do you get more access to volume, supply chains, battery packs and things? Yeah, it's first of all that we have the same technology basis, that we are working together on a common e architecture in the group, that we are working on common battery management system so that we can utilize this from the group and then apply this here. And of course, in this game we are in at the moment with supply chain, being part of a group and not just the Trayton group, but also the Volkswagen group helps a lot. So Scania, Scania is a part of the Trenton Group, and yes. they're forecasting that by 2030, half of their vehicle sales will be electric. Do you see Navistar being as aggressive? And then in the U.S. market, what do you project will be the percent of zero emission vehicle technology by Navistar in the U.S.? So I think uh, we are as aggressive, but it's not so much that we are so aggressive, but the customers are so aggressive. Because when we are looking at the TCO point, we think that in 2025, we basically have starting the tipping point for the TCO. So our customers will move to battery electric vehicles. We will see that the customers of our customers, the goods transport owners, they will require due to sustainability targets, zero emission transport. So we will also see that by 2030, at least 50% are battery electric. That is an excellent target to have. So you've just built a new state-of-the-art truck manufacturing plant. It can make com combustion vehicles and electric on the same line. Production doesn't seem to be as big an issue now, but there are some other barriers, infrastructure and other things. What do you, what do you think needs to be done on infrastructure? Yeah, infrastructure is a, is, a, is a common problem. It's an industry topic where we have to work together because it's not brand specific. Uh, we will have to, because our customers having mixed fleets, so we have to find solutions where everybody can charge. We will, of course, in the first step, have to find the overnight charging, the depot solutions, and then the on-highway. But the interesting part will be that, other than today, we will have a situation that it depends where you charge, how fast you charge, what time you charge, there will be a different price. So the logistics system will adapt to this and will have to figure out new ways how to deal with this. Well, I think it's really great that Tratton Group, along with Daimler and Volvo, have collaborated on supporting investments for charging infrastructure in Europe. Now in the US, how big is the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, the funding that's going to be provided through that program, going to support the rollout of infrastructure that you see needed for your trucks? Yeah, I think at the moment, at least when I see what all the programs are there being on, on federal level or on state level, money is there. 
the challenge is rather how to spend it, what is the right approach to spend it, and how get the whole permitting done. Uh, at least when we are talking to customers, the big topic is where they say we want to do something, but it's cumbersome because local governments don't know how to do the permitting, um, uh, the, the mm. electricity companies don't know how to deal with them. So I think we have to get over this hump, get it rolling, uh, and money is there. We just have to spend it wisely together. So we've talked about infrastructure, production's coming, TCO is coming. What else do we need to do to speed the introduction of zero emission trucks? Because it's still not going as fast as we may need for climate. Yeah, I, I think um, what, what we see, everybody, and you see this here at this exhibition, everybody has understood now it's coming, it's here. It's not, it's not if, it's just when. And now everybody putting the money, the capacity, the know-how to it. So I think what we have to work on is the infrastructure. All the other things are happening at the moment. Uh, we, we, every, we are very fast working on it. So looking at regulation, Trenton Group has been very supportive of some regulations that are helping to advance the market, such as the advanced clean truck rule. Where does Navistar see supporting the advanced clean truck rule? And I think that's going to be really important in the U.S. What, do you, what does that mean for Navistar? Yeah, but for us, the emission, we see the emission to zero emission trucks not really as a, something which is driven by regulatory issues. It's driven by the customers. Maybe because when the TCO point is there, uh, the customer will demand it, and as I mentioned, the goods owners will demand it. What we are looking at is that we have a stable regulatory environment because we will also have still the diesel engine. And we want to have a clear, stable environment because we also want to still improve the emissions of our diesel engines uh, looking forward. Let's just hit you with one last question. Give us a, a vision of e-mobility at Navistar. Where does it go next, how fast, and in, in particular, when are we going to see a Class 8 tractor? Let's say, um, when you're asking for a Class 8 tractor, I think we have to be really differentiated. We have to see what are the applications. Just being here in Long Beach, seeing at the harbor, yes, you need day caps who are pulling containers out of the harbor, electric, very soon. Do you need an on-highway long-haul truck which can go 600, 800 miles? That probably takes a little bit longer. So I think we have to be very specific there. And unfortunately, I cannot tell you all the secrets, but we're working on it. It will come soon. I hear soon. Yes. Okay. Well, that wraps up our CCTU segment for this month. Thank you so much for joining us wow. for all of what came out of the Advanced yeah. Clean Transportation Expo. But next month, we're going to be covering all of what's coming out of our Zero Mission Truck Showcase that's happening on June 8th. That is going to be such a big deal. We're going to have a, more than 30 trucks. We're going to have fleets able to drive, experience, and plan for zero emissions. Very exciting. Join us for that. But for now, that's all we've got for this edition. I'm Bill Van Amber. And I'm Alicia Gildy. And as we close out, we want to thank our super team that has made CCTU happen, starting with our executive producers, Jennifer Manfrey and Whitley Porter, mm -hmm. our coordinating producer, Carly Magnin, and then Heather Helsteed, as well as Amir Sharik and our Drop Media team. Thank you so much, you guys, for all that you do for us. It really takes a village and a team to get this done. We also want you to join us for our next episode. Plan for it. It's on June 28th at 11 a.m. Streaming later, live then. Until then, uh, make sure you check us out on social media to get the details and register for our live broadcast on our website. And we, we will, will CCTU soon. soon.